David, wonderful to have you on the show today. Where does this podcast find you today? Well, just outside of a town called Tenterton, which is on the south coast of England, about 45 minutes from London. So they call it officially the Garden of England. Oh, I know nothing about that part of the world. What's the weather like there? Well, recently it's been terrible. It literally, it's been the wettest summer so far on, on record. But generally speaking, it's a little bit better than places like Scotland and Wales, the southeast of England in particular. But it's pretty temperate right now. You know, we, we tend to get lots of kind of long, quite cloudy days. So not the place to come for a summer. But you know, if you're lucky, it's amazing. Best place to be in the world. But, you know, we have to take that chance if you go on a UK holiday. Absolutely. David, tell us a little bit about your background. So my first career was as operational firefighter in London Fire Brigade. So I served 15 years in that career. And parallel to that, I also had a role within fire rescue in looking at physical testing and recruit training and just looking at the tactical fitness levels for the fire service. I also now subsequently following an injury that ended that career some time ago led to kind of a period of reinvention, which has led to me now being a clinician, work as an osteopath in practice. And I also work population level in terms of health promotion strategies. So I work in projects that feed into the UK Healthy Aging Challenge, which is basically focused on lifestyle exercise choices that can lead to a better health span, which I know you're very familiar with. So I kind of wear several hats. I have several jobs and also do a bit of writing. This is why we're here, I guess, today just to talk about, you know, trying to reach a bigger audience with this message. And you wrote a book called Stronger, How to Build Strength, The Secret to a Longer, Healthier Life. Well, I did indeed. I, it came as a bit of a response to what I was seeing around me, the conversations I was having in clinic with people, the people I've been lucky enough to be working with over almost two decades now in terms of being their go-to for guidance and understanding their stories as they go from midlife into older age, what's worked well, what hasn't worked for them. And also parallel to that clinical work, I also work with a, a major UK arthritis charity. So I head up their division in terms of therapies and exercise strategies. And that's where I feed into these more national levels of project management, where we look at what works and what doesn't work when having conversations around starting people off into exercise and also then understanding once you've been working and exercising for a while, what what tends to feed into that longevity piece and that health span piece? Because in the UK, like the US, we tend to have a top heavy aging population. Well, globally, we know we do as well. As you know, from the work that you do as well, there's, there's a lot of interest in our, well, how can we now maintain that physical fitness, strength, tolerance for life through to our older age? and try and fight back against the what I see as an ultra convenient narrative which has now led to movement and physical challenge becoming optional for most of us through you know just modern modern living these days so that was my starting point I guess you would say for writing the book and I was trying to write a book a persuasion piece if you will to try to reach as many middle-aged people as I could to say this is relevant this is relevant to you and this is why but not just that because we know that doesn't work we know it's not enough just to say, really, everyone, we should be doing this, that and this, because we know that that isn't enough. It was more of a behavioral change challenge, really, in how to uh, persuade as many people as possible to make that healthy change. I don't know what you think, David, but I think often any healthy behavior change to overcome that ambivalence to doing nothing often starts with a story, often starts with a friendly conversation, a friendly chat. And so really, that's the style in which I wrote stronger trying to be the guy next door really to just try and speak to you as i would a friend or a patient that i've worked with for years so much of it is about habit right i brush my teeth every day i exercise my body every day absolutely there's nothing stronger than than an idea that leads to a behavior change that leads to habit there's nothing stronger than that and i think the work that i do both on an individual level and on the population level is around trying to build habit often by stealth really because as we know, it's not enough just to, just to point the finger and say to everyone, you know, you should do your 150 minutes a week or 75 minutes a week of vigorous exercise. We know that. But yet the numbers tell us that people don't do it. I think, you know, what we try to do with habit is how do we change exercise and make it boring almost? Because in my experience, boring, you know, as in, you know, ironing your shirt, brushing your teeth, you know, doing your, chore, your chores and admin around the house. How do you make it into something that actually feels a bit strange if you don't do it 
So that comes initially with having a conversation. And I think when it comes to strength training, it's it's about actually trying to push back a little bit against the narrative. Strength training, in my opinion, has been hijacked slightly by people who have the greatest influence online tend to not be giving the right information for the middle-aged cohort who are interested in health span and consistency. We all have to park our egos at some point, as I did, in terms of, you know, potentially the workout that I would have been drawn to 20 years ago, although quite exciting and quite aesthetically based, is likely not to contain the information and the kind of movement that I need to avoid injury, to avoid burnout, and to be able to turn up again and train again. Because if we do adopt those strategies that younger us potentially would have done, then you're probably going to get burnt out or injured. And in the long arc of your life over the next 20 years, which is where my interest lies in actually engaging in a program that promotes that long arc, as opposed to getting fit for the beach, that long arc, if we do take up something that potentially leaves us detrained, injured, or disillusioned, then actually we'll be weaker in the long run. And that's a tragedy to me. So I think, you know, in in many ways, I'm working with others in this area to try and change the narrative slightly and give more people who are in a similar age bracket permission to reclaim the gyms, to not to have to go hard or go home. That kind of pain is weakness, leaving the body narrative, which is great for my business in clinic, but not great for people who get injured. Right. Oh, so let's talk a little bit about muscle type, type one, type two. Talk to me a little bit about what those are and how those change as we get a little older. So I like to keep it quite simple because I think one of the things that turns people off is overcomplicating things. But what I do say, there are two different types of fast twitch fiber and one type of slow twitch fiber, generally speaking. The important thing to realize with slow twitch fiber and fast twitch fiber is that in the currency of aging, fast twitch fiber is gold dust. We do need our slow twitch fibers. We do need our fast twitch fibers. But if we tend to focus too much on aerobic type endurance type activities then we find that that's great for maintaining slow twitch muscle fiber things like ultra endurance endurance running swimming cycling just walking fantastic but it will not be encouraging maintenance or growth or improvement in the fast twitch fibers and what we need to understand is that from about 35 onwards we start to have this hormonal decline which a lot of us now becoming more aware of in the general population which can sometimes lead to frailty and weakness and a condition called sarcopenia in older age, which is that loss of lean skeletal muscle mass. Now, the absolute best way of fighting back and blunting that curve of decline is to do strength training. And the fast twitch fibers are larger and more powerful. So if we want to build that age-proof suit, that age-resistant suit of muscle fiber and maintain it into older age, it's a fast twitch fiber which we need to actually pay attention to. And that frankly is why strength training, I know you're deadlifting today as well, David. So that's why deadlifting is so good. When we lift, when we carry, when we grip, when we hang, when we pull, when we push against resistance, that fires our fast twitch fibers in a way that they're just not fired with endurance type activity. And so, you know, in clinic, often a conversation I have, you know, I'm often met with amusement by someone who's like an Ironman or someone who's run marathons or done a lot of very impressive endurance type activity, which don't get me wrong, is fabulous for cardiovascular health, metabolic health, mental health, joint health, you name it. But it's not fast twitch. For fast twitch maintenance, which is the currency of aging, we need to really lean into resistance training, strength training, anything that also has an element of bounce to it, an element of fast rapidity to it. So that can include things like tennis, slam balls, any throwing exercises, just bouncing, a skipping rope. You know, any of these things are fantastic for also firing up those fast twitch fibers because, you know, they say what they do on the box, they're fast. So yeah, I want out by science really that they are the currency of healthy aging. And there's lots of really great research papers to confirm that implicit relationship between doing more challenging things in that arena. I'm not talking about endurance. I'm talking now about, you know, the sorts of things like climbing ropes, lifting or lowering heavier, heavy weights, doing things at slightly less load, but higher intensities. Um, all the things that you would recognize in a circuit training class, all these things, you know, skipping, boxing, all these things that are slightly more dynamic, hitting a tennis ball, fantastic for firing those pathways. Not only are they important for building that 
larger, more powerful, reactive, age-resistant suit of muscle, but also in firing those muscles, those fast-twitch fibers in particular, we're actually engaging with our nervous system in a way that it's not engaged in the endurance system. And we know that in older age and aging per se, it's not simple enough just to say, oh, you know, muscle is everything. Actually, the muscle mass is there for a reason, which we can go into later, the advantages of keeping it in terms of our homeostatic health. But it's that relationship that we actually use that fast twitch fiber regularly. We're also using our nervous system regularly because um, it's our nervous system which dictates the sequence in which those fibers fire in a certain movement, in a certain movement, especially a compound movement that we might be using, like a deadlift or you know a squat. It's in those sequencing of firing that we also think there is a very deep cellular message sent to our brains and nervous systems per se to say you're still needed and to say you have to stay relevant you have to stay with this ability if we just sat then our bodies would become really good at just sitting so the more we can find varied ways of moving with power moving with intention moving against a bit of resistance we're not only outwardly improving that skeletal muscle mass via maintaining fast twitch fiber we are also maintaining the function and the regularity of function of our nervous system and there is we know that there is an implicit relationship between that and fast forwarding 10 15 years 20 years in some cases and you'll have a better outcome as an older person yeah that's right i think people forget the main thing your brain does is control your body yeah <laughs> it does a lot of thinking but it's yeah. made, it's yeah. made I mean, basically what it does is it controls your body as we do any movement, or especially novel or stressful movement in some way, you're getting neurogenesis and brain-derived BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, at least for myself, I feel awesome afterwards. So yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom, isn't there, in our body? Yeah. We just got to listen to it. I mean, our body is literally hardwired to reward us when we do something that's good for us. You can get addicted to anything and kind of overdoing that feeling if you're, you know, if you get a certain lift from things. But I, I call it the quickening when it comes to strength training in a similar way to if anyone's ever seen the Highlander movie where you get this kind of engagement of your whole self. It literally fires your nervous system in a way which I think it's meant to be fired. And one of the things that I said when I was kind of introducing myself was that we live now, all of us live in a world where movement is optional and we often opt not to challenge ourselves, especially in midlife, which is understandable. Often, a lot of us don't regularly challenge ourselves, even in a controlled way. I'm not saying about doing something ridiculous, but in a controlled environment, that challenge represented by lifting, lowering, gripping something is optional now. We think it's better to, to avoid movement and challenge often, but actually it's the opposite. We, we need to lean into that movement and challenge, feel that reward that you described. That reward is amazing. You know, I would say that's, being alive, you know, that those hormonal pathways that literally reward us. And actually, to your point about the neurological pathways, absolutely. I mean, if we think that part of the aging well bonus that we get from strength training and remaining stronger is in the nervous system, is in what we call a sensory homunculus at the sensory cortex level. Again, if we spend our time not moving or moving in linear patterns, which we're prone to do these days, unless you go hiking or, or skiing or, or find ways of moving differently in classes, then we tend to move in linear ways and we're not evolved to. We have evolved to challenge ourselves intellectually, to have stress in our lives. And that stress doesn't always have to be negative stress, distress. It can be use stress, which is very much the challenge of life, which you respond to. On an intellectual level, on a physical level, we need to sprinkle that in as well in a menu or recipe throughout our week to make sure that our body is getting that, that physical challenge and our brain is getting that physical challenge as well. Because the more we do, the more we become fluent in it. And I kind of compare strength training for novices as learning a new language and eventually you become fluent in it. And that's because you've laid down those myelination pathways, which literally insulate the nerves involved that make that firing faster. And when one is older, that can be the difference between life and death because a faster reaction of foot or faster reaction of grab will save us from falling. And as we know, falling over 65 is the biggest cause of death from injury over 65 globally. So again, it stops being about aesthetics and it starts becoming about these kind of discussions. For me, 
I think a lot of people that listen to this podcast, movement is not an option. This week, I wasn't able to do any really purposeful exercise for two days. And I found I didn't sleep as well. And I could not wait until Wednesday when I could like get back to my thing. I think one of the things that's astonished me is that there's this sort of idea that at a certain age, you can't, well, I can't run as fast as I used to run. This is true. <laughs> Probably never going to get that back. I'm okay with that. But I can do other things. And you can really make astonishing gains and improvements. I'm 65. I'm pretty strong. <laughs> but it takes time, right? It's like incremental. This is not something that happens over a couple of weeks. It's a series of, as you said, consistency of habit, right? You have to continue to repeat this week after week, month after month, year after year. Yes. And then you can see when my friend Joan McDonald was on this podcast a little while ago. And yeah, I remember her story. I think she was, I want to say 70, massively overweight, high blood pressure meds and everything. And then her daughter, luckily, was a trainer. Joan had this come to Jesus moment. Joan is now 75, can do 10 dead hang pull ups with a 25 pound weight on her. That's impressive in anyone's book. Impressive for you know, like you or I. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And she's, really strong and, fit and no more meds. I think that the thing that I like to tell people is this stuff, don't tell me you can't do it. I understand if you don't want to do it, that's fine. It requires, as the word that you use was purposeful and you mm. have to be purposeful about it. And it, mm. it, yeah, it's hard. It's like, as you, I love the analogy you meant about learning new language. Mm. It's mm. very much what it's like. I think, especially mm. for someone who we used to live in Venice, California. And I remember my wife walked into Gold's gym the first day and was just like, oh my God, get me. Cause it's really loud. There's all this banging and these like crazy yeah. guys in Speedos and they're greased up and they're like yeah, God, Olympians yeah. in there. It's like another thing. But once you sort of understand the methodology, yeah. Yeah. you just sort of become one of the, well, you don't become one of those people, but you understand what those people are doing and yeah. you're comfortable around them. Yeah. Oh, good for her because she's the out. She's an outlier there because a lot of people's reaction walking into those doors would be to about face as quickly as possible and get the hell out of there. Right. So I respect the fact anyone who stays and learns and actually gets past that initial shock because there is that initial shock. And I think you know yeah. my book is you know like a bit like a couch to five k for strength in that it would take someone who maybe didn't want to go there first, learn the ropes a bit, and then go there knowing a bit of the language, still yeah. not been able to speak it properly yet. It's, it's interesting, though, because we see your friend who's now doing weighted pull-ups. You know, that's quite a journey. And it's great that she did it when she did, because we know that in, in advanced older age, we can reacquire strength. We can right. reacquire. Yeah. But we can't always reacquire muscle mass to go with it. And because of the things I explained before, that is where some of the challenge lies. And that's why if anyone is listening to this in middle age and is exercising, continue whatever you're doing, if it's strength element, continue. If there's someone who's wondering whether I should, then yes, the answer is yes, I definitely should. Look into making a start in sensible, challenging strength training that suits your life stage. Often the issue we have is that, yes, you can reacquire strength, but actually we're always limited by the time we have left when we start because it is like a skill. And if you want to become an expert on your body, become your own PT and become fluent in that movement and the things that lean into understanding what your body's feeding back, good and bad, you have to have time to learn it. Otherwise, it's going to be a challenge. And the other thing I would say is there's a lot of people out there in this space, in fairness. One of the problems with getting people to say, yeah, I'm going to actually commit to something here and, and lean into this is because often they start the wrong type of program. And it's very easy if you start the wrong type of program to become disillusioned if for instance you have a longer layoff so you know midlife right it's tough you're working you've got family you know you might have children well I've got two grown-up children I'm still kind of looking after them it doesn't stop you know it's busy time and so with my training you know I would often sit and see people in my own experience still you know I've missed that milestone or I haven't done that part of the program and then people are more likely then to fall away thinking I've failed and actually I think what we need to do you know I'm 52 and, you know, I've been training all my life, but I've had to give myself permission to be middle-aged. And what that means is give yourself permission to fail almost, but fail within a framework 
it gives you permission to come back because we're not all Navy SEALs. We're not all in the SAS. We are living normal lives. We've got that long arc of we want to be really kicking ass at 80. And to do that, we need to keep turning up consistently. So for me, strength training now is just like I try to eat healthy most of the time. 90% of the time I eat healthy. 10% of the time I fall off the wagon and, you know, I might have a treat or there's a party or a holiday. But I know that over the arc of 20 years, which is now what I'm focused on, I'm going to come back 90% of the time to eating healthy. And I, and I see strength training the same. If I have a week where I'm in London or I'm busy with a project that needs attention and I can't do the training I had scheduled or I would have scheduled in my mind, I don't sweat it. I come back to it, though. I do come back to a framework which gives me permission to come back. And I think that's part of this discussion for the midlifers is give yourself permission to come back in a framework that's sensible. And as long as you keep coming back most of the time, then you are going to be kicking ass at 80. It's a fact. You will be. And it's about not falling off and falling away disillusioned or worse it's not about becoming injured or burnt out because that's very easy to do as well if you adopt too hard a program which is unrealistic too soon I yeah, imagine. Like what you said like i find that my pts one of their main functions is to dial me back mm. and say like that's enough stop no i know you want to like do some silly thing today but no, you're not doing that today. We're doing this other, more simple thing. That's also part of it. This idea of, I think, like what you mentioned, you know, training for the fire brigade, that's intense. Yeah. And as we're a little older, maybe I can do it, but I really shouldn't. It has to get dialed back. And I think some of this has to do with recovery. So that's, to me, one of the major differences between me now and me at 25 is that I really, really have to be not only purposeful about what I do, but very purposeful about how I recover from it if I want to do it again in the time frame that I would like to. I completely agree with what you're saying there. The biggest challenge is getting your recovery on point. And to that point, it's not just about being able to then come back and be consistent. It's about not being injured. Right. Because without recovery, you are, if you come back and do the same training program you might not get injured but you'll feel terrible you won't be able to do the full recovery and then you go into a bit of a spiral you'll overdo it and what was perfectly possible and feasible last week this week if you're unrecovered haven't slept well haven't eaten well you're, you're going to feel very different in response to that treatment and you'll have more inflammation in your cellulose in your cells which will then have to be dealt with so your your whole body will be working against you as opposed to working for you Recovery is key, and it's, it's partly why you know the biggest chapter in my book is about recovery, understanding pain, including delayed onset muscle soreness, which as people go to the gym know the word DOMS, don't we? we all know what that means. Understanding the difference between that and an injury, but also understanding how from very simple, very simple tools that we can use to recover quickly after an exercise session can more quickly get us into that recovery zone. So in emergency services or in the military services now there's a lot of people using protocols that immediately after your workout now the majority of us i would hope listening to this would not be adverse to doing some stretching but how many of us would be adverse to thinking about stretching in a really silent space whilst box breathing or whilst doing right. some mindful breathing and very quickly therefore not only getting your ligaments tendons and joints into a post-exercise state to quickly recover but also your nervous system mm -hmm. and we know that simple box breathing which is that four 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 protocol which is so effective and very simple if you don't like that kind of protocol getting on a treadmill and nose breathing at a reasonable lick whilst walking will also bring your nervous system back from a sympathetic state which is a state in which we exercise and which we achieve things athletically into a parasympathetic state which is the state within which we repair and recover more quickly. So it's a kind of no-brainer to get more quickly from A to B. So not just in, in, the, in the sense of recovery, oh, I'm going to really look at sleep hygiene, I'm going to make sure that I'm getting my seven or eight hours or whatever it is that's optimal for you. It's about more quickly coming down from that sympathetic state as quickly as you can, because there's a real benefit to that. And it might be marginal, but we're talking about over the next 20, 25 years of training. So that marginal benefit suddenly takes on a real palpable benefit over the course of that much time. And frankly, it's free. You know, why not try it?
you know, why not try just kind of doing five, 10 minutes of box breathing? I know people who take eye patches, you know, a sleep mask mm-hmm. to a gym and they just lay on their back, breathe mm-hmm. with diaphragmatic breathing to really engage. Mm-hmm. They don't care what they look like. And I think in middle age, that's a great advantage, isn't it? You say, who cares? I'm not here for aesthetics. I'm here for my body and for my wellness. So, you know, I think that that's where we do have an advantage is that we can do stuff that maybe doesn't look that cool, but who cares? You've described exactly what I do after yeah, my great. training. I'm, I lay my back. I put my feet up against the wall. I put a towel over my eyes. There we go. I put some like new agey relaxation, that sort of stuff they play in like massage places. And I yeah. put my hand on my belly and I do that for like five minutes to get that parasympathetic system engaged. And, yeah. you know, what I found is that not only can one train, strength train, endurance train, cardio train, you can also train the parasympathetic system to click on. So it becomes Mm -hmm. something that is very useful, especially if you're involved in some kind of athletics, being able to go where it's like, I do this silly thing. I do ski racing. So like when when I come down to the bottom of that run, I am hyper sympathetically (laughs) activated and the quicker I can pull that down couple of deep breaths and you notice that in really highly trained athletes they're able to go from full on to full off like in just a couple of breaths and i, I think that's a really valuable skill i agree david and I, I talk about a little bit about this in the book in that we can take from professional sports you know i, I had the privilege of working at the world athletics championships in london and you know i was around literally the most athletic people in the world i mean it was an experience to to be amongst those people and you do see these practices it's very natural. They actually use the brain in a really interesting way because they do the pre and post bit so well, which we can adopt. They do the visualization, which sometimes starts the moment you wake up that day. You visualize, think about today, I'm going to do this exercise, and you think about it for a few minutes. I know that some of these people do it, and I talk about this in that we can adopt these practices at any age. Today, I'm going to do a pushing or pulling or lifting session, and you think about it before. Because in thinking about it, you are actually lighting up some of the same neurons. The mirror neurons work in that way. If you watch someone moving, you light up 20 odd percent of the same neurons you would do normally, which is why I give these protocols to people who are injured with a broken leg. I say, okay, then one of the first things you need to do is start watching the sport or watching videos of yourself in that sport if you're a sports person. But if you're not, then being around that sport. But to the point of using these protocols, Visualization is hugely important. Yeah, the Olympics are now here. Or today, it's today, I believe. It's the opening ceremony. Yeah, yeah, can't wait. Michael Phelps was an advocate, a huge advocate. A lot of his success he puts down to hours and hours and hours of mindful meditation, of visualizing the perfect turn, visualizing the perfect race. And they would be out of the water and very quickly into that down regulation, as you just described as well. So it's there for the taking. You know, it's free. It works. Just something as simple as before you in the car outside the gym or just before if you're working out from home just before you do so and then very quickly come out of that phase because it's a tool that's like anything else and some people don't realize that that there's a lot of benefit to be gained from actually putting this into your life and i talk about just normal life as well because you you're spot on david in the majority of us work the majority have to have sometimes at work difficult conversations or challenging conversations or maybe that's in your personal life who knows <laughs> But we all have to have conversations sometimes where you think, oh, this isn't fun. Or you might have to have one conversation and quickly go to another. Now, I see that as practice for the gym because you can deploy the same box breathing, the same down regulation you just described to your everyday life because practice makes perfect. You know, the more we practice that, leaning into that feeling of slight stress and high diaphragm in whatever we're doing could be at a checkout line. Who knows? You know, waiting on a call. Who knows? On a, on, you know, you're waiting on a, you know, on a, you know, for someone to come back to you, and it's eight, ages and ages. You're getting annoyed. Down regulate. Take that opportunity, because it doesn't matter where you're. It's the same pathway. Your nervous system doesn't know. Your brain does. The cognitive frontal part does, but the rest of your primal nervous system doesn't know that it's that you know you're on a phone call waiting to be put through to the opera. Whether you're on a phone or whether you're in the gym, just finished a, a very hard workout. All it knows is that hormonally. And neurologically, you're at a heightened state. That's why pros can do it within two or three breaths because they practice it. And again, 
it's one of that low hanging fruit, David, that, you know, it's there for everyone but to grab that with both hands, I would say, because it works. It really works. It really does. In both in workout and normal life as well. Yeah. And I think that's one of the other things that I've learned is this idea of stress. What you mentioned, there's sort of two kinds of stress. There's chronic stress, bad. And then stress that I'll say is like tactical stress, right? It's like we're intentionally doing something. We're going to make a hormetic adjustment to that stress. So we get a little stronger, but the hmm. body and the brain don't really segregate out like work out stress and work life stress. It's all stress load, right? So if you have too much life stress, whatever that is, hmm. it's going to impact your ability to recover from the physical stress. It's the same thing. And monitoring that I think is quite important. I think it's a really interesting point you've raised because people don't often think, you know, what do I have to consider to maintain my muscle mass into older mm. age? They may well include diet. Yeah, great. They may well include, they will often hopefully include strength training or resistance training or some kind of dynamic activity. But if you say to them, stress control, you know, stress management, down regulation, they mm. would look at you and think, hang on, hang on, how? And it's because of the pathways you've just described. If someone's chronically stressed and anxious in their life, generally, they're going to be hedging more towards low grade mm. sympathetic constantly than that gear change because if we're in one or the other too much then that's not good but we need to be able to navigate between the two skillfully and if we do get stuck and unfortunately unfortunately because of modern lifestyles you know technology etc i think there is this epidemic really of chronic anxiety and stress that we're seeing in all ages especially younger people but i think i would say all ages and that's part of the message as well in that if we can get a handle on that it's going to actually lean into if you're taking the time and making the effort to put strength training or yeah, an all-round hybrid on a program which includes strength training into your life then do the work on how you feel as well do the work on how to down regulate as well because if you can just approach it really matter of factly and think right okay well next time i'm having a really challenging conversation at work or in private life i'm going to deliberately try to down regulate again the nervous system doesn't care where you are it just knows that it feels nice to come out of that feeling. It does pay dividends over the long run if we're better at more skillful at doing that in maintaining our, our fast twitch muscle fibers, which, as I say, is the kind of real currency for older age health. It does delve into the realm of psychology, but why not? Because, you know, you can't compartmentalize body and mind. We are one. You know, the nervous system, I would argue, is the conduit between the two. So anything we can do to use the nervous system as that conduit it's not just one way travel it's two way travel we can we can affect it in both directions by practice and it's often very simple things like you know i'll tell you what changed my life david i've read a book called breathe by james nestor and oh I, yes of course great, great book. book great yeah. book and i read it and i thought my partner sarah gave it to me and i thought yeah wonderful book beautifully written i adopted some of the practices nose breathing i now go for a brisk walk every day and i nose breathe if I don't want to go for a jog, I'll nose breathe and brisk walk because my heart rate is a kind of similar zone too sometimes if I find a hill. I'm not getting the impact on my joints, which is a good thing sometimes for me because I did have a career-ending injury many years ago, which I have to manage. But what I find it does, not only does it does it give me a kind of low-level, solid zone two training session, it also is the ultimate expression of mindfulness because it's hard to hold on to that nose breathing. It's hard to hang on to it. You know, you think all you can think about is I'm not going to breathe through my mouth. I'm not going to... Before you know it, you've left all your problems behind and you're just thinking about that. I mean, it's mindfulness whilst moving. It's wonderful. Let's touch on strength training. I just want to be like clear. So the reason we want to strength train is yeah. quite simple. <laughs> when you're walking, yeah. there will come a moment when you trip. Guarantee. Yeah. The difference between you're being able to get that right leg out there to keep you from face planting and not is your fast twitch muscles. That's it. That's the name of the game. You want that. I want to shift a little bit to the other kind of training or one other kind of training, which would be cardiovascular, which is also one of the things that I personally find, it's like a lot of stuff we got to train here, right? We got to train our strength train. We have to train our cardio systems. We have to train our balance systems. Lately, I've realized my eyes have gotten lazy from just looking straight ahead Oh, yes, so yes, I've, yes. I've been training my, which seems like really weird, but if I'm like on a spin bike or something, I, I train my eye muscles. You can feel them. It hurts when you do that. Yeah, yeah. Let's go to cardio. 
Okay. It's interesting because the World Health Organization, just like the NHS, and probably over there with you guys, your health providers try and promote 150 minutes of moderate exercise or 75 minutes more vigorous exercise. And they're generally talking about endurance exercise then. So let's talk about that. And the 10,000 steps thing, which is also seeped into, you know, consciousness now. What I find interesting about that is that when we relay back, where does that come from? Where does all this 150 minutes or 10,000 steps come from? We can trace it back to 1940s in the UK, where there was the UK government after post-World War II were looking at a lot of men and women who were having heart attacks in the 50s and 60s thinking, we think it's something to do with movement, but we're not sure what this is. This is cardiovascular health. We're not sure what this is. So they did a study and they looked at bus conductors and bus drivers in London. So big red buses going around. And in the old days, you had a conductor and you had a staircase. And I remember these. This is how old I am. I'm showing my I've got on these ones. They're not there anymore. But they used to have a conductor and used to buy a ticket off the conductor. And this conductor was constantly going up and down the staircase all day, whereas the driver was just sitting. And so they tracked these two cohorts and they found far less cardiovascular disease, far less heart attacks in the conductor and then put it together. And then suddenly, Eureka, oh, so actually steps, movement, cardiovascular exercise does have an impact. And impact. So that's where we started from. I think for me, the most important thing to think about cardiovascular training is if you want to improve, you need to go slower. And that's hard message to filter through to people who are hard charging individuals who are competitive individuals. And I put my hand up to this because I was a competitive rower for 15 years. You know, it was all about how much pain can you take, push yourself to a point of unconsciousness type training. As with my parallel career in the fire service, again, you have to be able to push yourself to that point where you understand where you're going to black out and not. So I've been at those training ends of that training parameter where it's all about, you know, upper zone training. And the thought of zone two training to me was an absolute anathema until I started looking into, you know, the educational pieces or understanding what true exercise physiology is. And then you realize, oh, okay. Then there's this piece around, well, 80% of the time, really 80 to 90% of the time we should be doing the zone two, which is boring often and should be. When you spend time around professional athletes, See, on social media, what you see with athletes is you see the exciting stuff, don't you? Because that makes good content, right? You don't see them doing an hour and a half nose breathing walk. Or you don't see them doing a really, really, really slow jog where people are walking faster than them sometimes, you know. But this is the hard yards that often endurance athletes do to improve their VO2 max. And I think for it's especially important to hammer that message home in the same way that you don't want to overtrain your strength training. You don't want to overtrain in aerobic training because that's where you do build up cellular information mm-hmm. that accelerates aging, it decreases your recovery. And often leaning into that boring zone two conversational training. I say boring, I like it, but people might perceive it as boring. And then occasionally pushing yourself, sprinting up the hill. So mm-hmm. 20% of the time you do that and 80% of the time you do the other stuff. It's quite simple. You know, I don't like to overcomplicate it. I don't care how people get their 2080 bit. It can be done anyway. I, I prefer if it's in a controlled way, you know, where you minimize the risk of injury. But frankly, any way you do it. And the great news is that if someone is listening to this and they're current, currently not very active, they stand to gain the most amazing gains. The most amazing gains. I mean, I'm on record. There's so much research to say that I rub my hands together and meet someone who's currently inactive because they're going to make the gains. Simply walking will strengthen your body as well as improve your cardiovascular VO2 max. It improves your tolerance for life. Again, my whole stick now is about simplifying things. And that's why I don't overcomplicate the programming in my book. I don't want to overcomplicate it. We should be in... Although this book is called Stronger, you know, I also advocate that we should be not avoiding getting our steps in, but we need to get our reps in as well. So steps and reps. The great thing to your point about having to do balance and stability work is if we are doing an element of faster cardiovascular training, so a little bit of sprint training, a little bit of fast, you know, interval training, if we are also combining that with an occasional fast segment in our strength training where we're dropping the weight and doing faster repetitions to work on power which is easily done that communication again from brain 
to muscle and the output of speed or power by default improves our balance as well and i think that's the real bonus of, of anything done slightly faster as well but only for 20 percent of the time i do maybe once a week or maybe once every two weeks do i really do full-on vo2 max training because it's just too stressful yeah. on my body and the rest of it everybody's really time compressed you can sort of stack these things and i live on the side of a mountain at the moment so i can get my walk in nature so de-stressing yeah. I've also learned that if I wear a weight vest and I'm going up sort of uneven terrain, the weight vest sort of sits up on the top of my body, which requires my core to activate and my balance, or otherwise I'm going to fall over. So I can sort of put a bunch of these things together rather than separate them. Like oh, yeah. how many of these can I put on top of each other and get them sort of check off the list in that amount of time? I love that. I, I'm very similar in my approach. If I usually go out to a weighted walk weighted i think you call it weighting rocks don't you in the us the other day i was visiting some family in wales I'm surrounded by mountains there and there's a cairn right at the top you know which is a waypoint for mountaineers so i regularly build that can up because i pick a nice boulder at the bottom only last week you know there's a video of me kind of sweating and struggling up this what would have been a lovely hike otherwise and at the top i put you know the extra three thousand feet up there goes another rock on the top of the can. Because right. the aficionados amongst the listeners would say, oh, yeah, that's a farmer's carry, which we know is good for grip, which we know is good for core stability, especially if it's one-sided and you change hands. It's moving in my mind as we've evolved to move, isn't it? It's the most basic expression, the most beautiful expression of movement, a loaded walk uphill. But I think there's a progression here, right? So yeah. people out there who've never done this, don't do this right away because Absolutely. you want Sort of Absolutely. like maybe you know, you know flat ground, no weight. Yeah, if we're taking that as an example, then the starting point would be just go for a walk, enjoy the yeah. nature, you That's know, right. go with a friend, have a chat, and then if you're on your own next time, try to nose breathe, and then the next time if you do that, maybe a weighted ruck or a weighted walk right. in whatever way you want. But yeah, progression is everything. But also giving yourself permission to not yeah. do that if you have that plan and you start that morning and you think actually I don't feel great then just go for a walk. Right. Just go for a walk because yeah. that's where the real knowledge, you know, one of the benefits of being middle-aged is is having a bit of life experience, right? And knowing what works for you. This idea of self-knowledge. You know, we talk a lot on this show about personalized medicine and yeah. essentially personalized medicine is you or some metric knowing you. Yes. And I think in this case, for years, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I check my resting heart rate yeah. And I check my heart rate variability. And those two things tell me sort of what I'm allowed to do that day. And if I find my resting heart rate is way up and my heart rate variability is way down, that means all we're going to do today is a gentle walk. We yeah. need to like, whatever's going on, we just need to dial it down until things come back. Absolutely. Yeah, the resting heart rate is a great starting point for people to understand recovery as well. Yeah. That kind of, and measure over a couple of months because your resting heart rate will improve if you do start doing those dramatically uh, sympathetic, sympathetic breathing exercises yeah. you will improve that will come down over time it's a great barometer for what you should be doing that day absolutely i do that myself i think it's very wise i call it physical literacy you, right. you become literate literate in knowledgeable in what your body's trying to tell you your body is requesting things all the time we just got to listen that's right and sometimes as i tell people feelings are not facts I may feel like, okay, we're going to really hit it today. And the fact is, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, this yeah bag today. I mean, don't get me wrong. Sometimes I get it wrong. Yeah. But the next morning I think, okay, okay, reset. If you catch anyone out, the, the sun is out. Well, occasionally in this country, if the sun comes out, you know, you tend to do a bit more, you know, especially if you're out and about in a garden or, you know, in the wilderness. It's, it's important to know what your set points are, you know, what your normals are, because yeah. it's very then easy to realize when you can do a bit more and we can do a bit less and again frame that within the framework of a framework with which gives you permission to do that that's mm -hmm. important i think that's the message that has to get through i think often to people at the beginning of their journey and what i would say is if people are starting their their journey towards cardiovascular training and, and strength training in midlife it's a great time to start we know from some of the scientists i've interviewed and worked with that it's one of the it's the formative time that on which many of the older age health outcomes will be decided. And actually, I had a really interesting conversation a few weeks ago with a journalist who 
was talking to me and her husband, there were 45, both of them, husband and wife. The lady was was speaking to me and she said, my husband knew I was talking to you today and asked me to ask you a question. And I said, sure, what is it? And she said, well, he stopped exercising shortly after university, so 23, sedentary job, hasn't done anything, but knows he wants to do more activity, starting slowly, adopt some of the practices that we talk. And I said, great. So what's the question? She said, well, is it okay for me? I said, well, of course it's okay, but start slow. And I said, not only is it okay, but if your wife, who is a lifelong exerciser, was to stop, and I was to stop, and you were to continue, for a few years, physiologically would be the same. Not for that much longer than that, though. And then eventually, if we continue to stop and he continued, he wins. Mm -hmm. He wins age 70 or 80. He wins the gold medal aging. I think it's one of the most challenging times in life, but also it holds the most benefit. Ultimately, there's a lot to gain in midlife as well. That's right. David, thank you so much for being on the show. Your book is Stronger, How to Build Strength, The Secret to a Longer, Healthier Life. Something that we should all aim for. Thank you, David. And thanks for having me. It's been great. Absolutely. Take care now. Bye.